Beth and Jonathan Singer are the senior rabbis at Temple Emmanuel here in San Francisco. And they are like big siblings to me. I look up to them. They're like the seniors and I'm the freshman. I always feel that way. We've been friends for about nine years. But I received a few weeks ago an invitation from Beth um, to come to an interfaith gathering with 13 clergy. So half of them are Jewish, half of them are not Jewish. And the point was to talk about the violence in the Middle East. Now Beth is so articulate and she opened up our whole time together with a prayer and with a conversation about how deep the sense of concern she feels for people who are living in Gaza. She also talked about her support for a two-state solution to the diplomatic crisis. And then she also talked about the terrible pain that she and other Jews have been feeling about family who have friends who are um, hostages deep underground in Gaza. I heard about many funerals, some of young people. And Beth said that she hoped that in our meeting together that we would really speak from the heart even if this were to lead us into a difficult place. So then all the Jewish leaders spoke, and then all the Christian leaders spoke, except for me. And then Jonathan looked at me and said, well, Malcolm, what do you have to say? And I said, I was thinking to myself, I really don't have very much to say. I've never been to the Middle East. I'm a step removed from so much that's happening. It is difficult to talk about how horrifying and inhumane the terrorist attacks by Hamas are, and yet at the same time to recognize that the situation for ordinary people in Gaza seems impossible. So I told them, I told them the truth, that in our community we are connected to Jews, we have Jewish families, Jewish Episcopal families who are here at the cathedral, and we're connected to the Palestinians. I said that every day we pray for peace, that we long for peace. Now this seemed understandably to upset one of the rabbis who I don't know quite as well. She said that peace is not enough. After the terrible violence, after the murders, after something has to be done to make things right. And I think all of us in that room felt the incredible tension. We could see her trauma, anger, and despair as she emphatically said that prayers are not enough. And we say that here too, don't we? We say that when we talk about the epidemic of gun violence. It felt like we'd moved a world away from that Hebrew prayer of blessing before the meal. God is not just hidden in violence and in inhumanity. God can be hidden to us also in our personal pain and fear and in our humiliation when we have said the wrong thing. God also seems hidden in those last days of Jesus when he came to the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus rides in a palm procession through the adoring crowds. He goes directly to the temple. He overturns the tables of the money changers. He's healing the blind and the lame. But most of all, what he is doing is teaching. And the religious leaders They fear his popularity. They want to remove him. They want to arrest him. But they are afraid of all the crowds who love him. Make no mistake. God is hidden here. The leaders come in bad faith. They're not there to ask real questions about who God is. They begin with flattery. They call Jesus teacher. They use in their first sentence the word truth twice to describe himself. Self to, to himself, to, to describe Jesus to himself. The word aletheia is the gr- word that they use. So they say you're sincere, you only teach the truth. Both of those are the words truth re- reduplicated. Then when we translate in English as being impartial, they say you are impartial. In Greek what this is is for you do not see the face of the person. In other words, Jesus treats every person equally regardless of who they are. Pointedly, the Pharisees, the Pharisees on the one hand, they vigorously oppose Roman occupation of the Holy Land. And they have with them the Herodians, the ones who support King Herod's son, Herod Antipas. These are the people who are receiving the money from the taxes. 
So these two different groups who disagree with each other vehemently have come together to interrogate Jesus. And Jesus knows that if he says that, um, that, we, should, that we should pay taxes to, our, the, to the emperor, that the Pharisees and the regular people are going to hate him. And he knows that if he says, if we shouldn't pay taxes, that we shouldn't pay taxes to the emperor, then he will be arrested for sedition. And the, that's the situation that Jesus finds himself in. Jesus understands that it is a trap. He understands that in that moment, God is hidden. So Jesus says, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin. And the coin is a denarius. And it would have featured an image of the emperor Augustus. An image in Greek is icon. An icon of the emperor. And on it would have been the inscription that read, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, Augustus. And interpreters point out that Jesus does not have a coin. Otherwise, he wouldn't have asked for one. And when the religious leaders, they produce a coin in the temple, it is a kind of sacrilege. In other words, they're violating the first of the two first commandments. First, thou shalt have no God before me. And it clearly says on the coin that emperor is the God. And second, thou shalt make no graven images. They hand Jesus the symbol of an entire empire built on slave labor and the extraction of unjust taxes. And in that moment, the religious leaders collaborating with a brutal empire, they are attacking a loving and righteous person. When God seems so hidden, Jesus helps us to really see who God is. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God, the things that are God's. Now, when we usually hear this, the intent is to divide the world into a, a sacred realm and a secular realm, right? The realm of Caesar and taxes and politics and the realm of God and holiness and sacredness. But this is not at all what Jesus is doing. Jesus is instead pointing out that the coin is Caesar's. It bears Caesar's likeness. It bears the icon of Caesar. But you and me and every human being, we all bear the icon, the image of God. And so we belong to God. And our whole lives should be given to God. And they are, aren't they? When we participate in God's mission, when we oppose cruelty and unfairness and greed, when we give ourselves wholly to love, justice, and mercy, then we really are in the image of God. This happens also when we honor and respect each other, not just when we ask, not when we ask cynical questions designed to entrap others. It happens when we listen with real curiosity and the compassion that leads us to see God present in another person. Every time we rec fail to recognize the dignity of another, we miss the chance to see God. But there are other ways that God is hidden from us. This week, I'm going to be interviewing on the forum Robert Sapolsky, a neuroscientist who I interviewed a few years ago. Um, he's from Stanford University, and he has recently written a book um, basically saying that no human being has free will. So like the Puritan John Calvin or the Jewish theologian Baruch Spinoza, he doesn't believe there is any such thing as free will. That everything that happens, happens because of something that happened before it. That everything is determined in that kind of chain of events. Now for me, although he tries to prove this scientifically, this is not a scientific question. It's more of a theological or philosophical belief. And it certainly can't be established by the scientific method or scientific reasoning. But for Sapolsky, what this view actually means is that no one should be blamed for anything that they've ever done, and including ourselves. And I think he finds a kind of comfort in that, in, in, in this world where we don't blame people for the actions that they've taken. And yet at the same time, he also, there's a kind of sadness that is present in his work. He writes this, the science ultimately teaches that there is no meaning, 
There is nothing but an empty, indifferent universe that we are, quote, biological machines, unquote. So Sapolsky, he believes that there is no rational reason to take care of these biological machines, which we call human beings. And in him, every atom seems to rebel against that conclusion. He wants so badly to live in a world, in a universe of love. And yet something, an ideology, is holding him back. It's like he's on the other side of a paper wall and all he has to do is reach through and enter a new place. The theologian Catherine Sondrager writes a lot about the importance of Moses seeing God. She writes that God is hidden from us because, as it says in the Hebrew Bible, God is one. If you think about that, God is one. God is utterly unique. God is completely different than anything else that we experience. And so because of that, God is naturally hidden from us. And yet God decides to show himself. But in his own way, beyond our control. Now, Catherine Sondrager, when you meet her as a theologian, as a person, she is a deeply humble person. And she believes that God also is humble and that God finds us in our moments of humility. If we think scientific knowing is the only kind of knowing or wisdom, we miss something of fundamental importance. We, come, we become strangers to the one who should be most intimate to us. Sondrager writes, God's mystery is not marked out by a realm that lies beyond our knowing, beyond the finite limits of our intellect. Rather, God is real in our encounter with him. And in just this way is exceeding mystery, superabundant light. So you get that, right? That God is by nature mysterious. God is by nature hidden. And yet God reaches out to us and touches us. The 20th century monk Thomas Merton addresses God when he says this. How shall we begin to know who you are if we do not begin ourselves to be something of what you are? He goes on. We receive enlightenment only in proportion as we give ourselves more and more completely to God by humble submission and love. We do not first see, then act. We act and then see. And that is why the man who waits to, to see clearly before he will believe never starts on the journey. Where is God hidden? God is hidden in the places where we see, we, we fail to recognize each other. I'm so grateful for our interfaith colleagues for these relationships through the years. And after that tense encounter, we, we were so close. And I, I came away from that meeting so filled with joy that we were all struggling to teach the way of love during this time of division. Now for homework, I want you to try the same thing. I want you to do what Beth Singer does and to reach out to someone who disagrees with you. Not to change that person's mind, but to see how they're doing and to be with them. The poet Denise Levertov's father was an Anglican priest and at the age of 60, this shows there's time for all of us, she became a Christian. And I want to close with a poem she wrote called Flickering Mind. Lord, not you. It is I who am absent. At first, belief was a joy I kept in secret, stealing alone into sacred places, a quick glance and away, and back, circling. I have long since uttered your name, but now I elude your presence. I stop to think about you, and my mind at once darts away, darts into the shadows, into gleams that fret, unceasingly over the rivers purling and passing. Not for one second will myself hold still, but wanders 
anywhere, everywhere it can turn. Not you. It is I am absent. You are the stream, the fish, the light, the pulsing shadow. You, the unchanging presence in whom all moves and changes. How can I focus my flickering, perceive at the fountain's heart the sapphire I know is there? God is not absent. And yet we are not fully present either. May we listen with curiosity and compassion. May we see the icon of God in every person we encounter. May the humility, truth, and surrender of Jesus draw us into the superabundant light of divinity.